This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast Show 682. So there's this cowork and, and, and out of the world more calls it flex office, and I think that's more the appropriate term because when you hear co-working, you think uh, more of like the hot desk version of WeWork. Um, but but flex office is actually a subtype of office that's tracked as a subtype of office in places like the UK. For a long time, for the last 20 years now, actually, since so started in 2003, I think Cushman and Wakefield started tracking flex office as a, as a as an actually property type. What's going on, everyone? This is David Green, your host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast, here today with one of my favorite co-hosts, the amazing Data Deli, Dave Meyer, with another bigger news episode. Dave, how are you today? I'm all right, man. I was actually kind of sick, but I was uh, so excited to have this conversation that I rallied to uh, talk about this very important topic and get a chance to hang out with everyone here. So one of the things I love about you is I too have been rallying after BPCon. I've been pretty sick, but the show must go on. Oh yeah. Uh, At BP, we've been talking about, there's like a BP flu going around. Like everyone, there's just a hangover for sure. It hit me very hard. It was a lot. It's intense. It was super fun, but like it, it, uh, you know, it's like a pull forward on all of your energy. <laughs> and like, I was just feeling drained for a few days after. that. And I don't sleep well, like if I'm out of town. So I was getting maybe three, four hours Ooh. of sleep a night. And then you combine that with the traveling in the airports, all the hands you're shaking, all the hugs and the pictures you're taking. Like it was a recipe for getting sick. But still, if I had to go back, I would do it again. I'd do it again next week. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, you're in Amsterdam. You know how to party. It's not going to scare you. <laughs> Speaking of parties, on today's show, we interview a very impressive guest, Kevin Fagan, one of the senior analysts at Moody's Analytics who loves commercial real estate and also has a background in architecture. So he's coming from a very well-rounded position. Why should we be listening to this, you ask? Well, commercial real estate is one of the juggernauts in the space of the like, sort of the overall impact that real estate has, and this space is changing, much like residential real estate had the entire anal- anal- analysis of these properties change when short-term rentals started to take effect, and as medium-term rentals become more popular, we're seeing that changing how properties are valued. The same is true of commercial space. The industry is changing, and we want to be ahead of how those changes come. It's always better to know where you're going and get there first than to see what everybody else did and try to play catch up. So today's episode is very fascinating. We have a pretty impressive guest. And Dave, I got to say, I thought this was one of your better performances. What exactly were you doing (laughs) that allowed you to come up with such good questions? (laughs) I don't know, man. It's just someone starts talking data. I just get laser focused in on what they're talking about and like to follow it. But uh, thank you. I appreciate that. But Honestly, like you said, I really like, uh, you know, I don't really invest in office space. I, I mean, I don't at all. I do own a couple of REITs in the space, but I, I own residential real estate. And uh, but I still really like this topic because I think what's going on in the corporate world and what's going on in office space has driven a lot of changes in the economy as a whole and subsequently residential real estate, right? Like when work work from home really started taking over during the pandemic, people started moving to the suburbs and we started seeing residential homes grow faster in the suburbs than in urban landfill, which is like a totally big change from what had been happening post great recession. You know, we saw the cities grow a lot faster than the suburbs and sort of my assumption going into this conversation was like, that's going to continue. But I think Kevin shared some really interesting data and insights about what's happening in the office space. And if you're interested in office investing, it's going to be super interesting. You'll be really love this. But even if you're a residential investor like me, and I think David, you're primarily only a residential, like you learn a lot about this that can really inform your investing strategy that you, um, you'll think you'll get a lot of nuggets from this. Yeah, that's exactly right. I don't like the investing approach that says, let me just see what else everyone else is doing and copy it. That's lazy and you end up losing money because usually by the time that you hear about the latest trend, totally. everybody else has already <laughs> run it up, right? The better way to invest is where are things going? How can I see where it's going to evolve and how can I get ahead of that? Like imagine if you were one of the very first people to get into the short-term rental space. You crushed it. You made a ton of money. You have this amazing uh, list of reviews on Airbnb. It's very hard for someone coming in like me now to catch up with someone who got into this 10 years ago. The same is true of all real estate. And so I'm excited for how things are evolving in the commercial space and we're going to talk about that. But before we do, today's 
Quick tip is, as we're wrapping up an interesting year in real estate, 2023 is new territory for sure. Inflation, as well as days on market, and interest rates are all up. Make sure you're tuning in weekly to hear the stories and the tactics that we are working on right now to keep you informed. We love that you are listening to all of our content. We want to prime you for where you can make the biggest impact, and that is staying real time with what is happening here on this podcast and the On The Market podcast as well. I've said it before. I will say it again. Real estate is evolving at a faster pace than it ever has before, which means you need information more than you ever needed it before. We are committed to bringing it to you, so make sure you prioritize that. Dave, any last words before we bring in Kevin? I'll just say I love that point because honestly, I like when it's kind of the situation where everything's changing quickly because if you are informed, you have a big advantage. And so I, 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 I like being informed and I like that other people are not going to spend the time or, you know, dedicate themselves to understanding the market and how to take advantage of it. It's, it's more for me and you, man. It's more for everyone who's listening and staying informed. So uh, I, I love that quick tip. Change is bad for the lazy and change is good for the prepared. Exactly. All right, let's bring in Kevin. Welcome, Kevin Fagan, to the Bigger Pockets podcast. Kevin has quite the impressive resume here. He's the senior director and head of CRE Economic Analysis at Moody's Analytics. He has degrees from the University of Texas in what did you get your major in there, Kevin? Uh, architectural engineering. Architectural engineering. You've worked in that field for a while and actually designed buildings in California. Is that right? That's right. Yep. About t- about a decade of that. <laughs> a decade of that. And then you said, okay, I've had enough of this. I'm going to own my own real estate. And you built a portfolio. So can you give us a brief rundown of what makes up your portfolio today? Uh, well, it's relatively small. It's kind of more of a side thing. But, you know, we have a hotel, some Airbnbs, multifamily, mobile home parks, and uh, might be branching out into some other stuff soon. Yeah, that doesn't sound small at all. But thank you for being humble. <laughs> <laughs> So you're here to talk with us today about commercial real estate and office space in particular. Dave Meyer, you got to be freaking out over there with giddiness. How are you feeling right now? I'm excited. I love talking about commercial real estate. I feel like we, in, in, in bigger pockets in general, we talk a lot about commercial real estate in the context of large multifamily investments. Sometimes, we, you know, a lot of our listeners are interested in self-storage, but Honestly, we don't talk a lot about office or retail or industrial real estate. And it's this whole other side of the real estate investing world that I personally think our invest our listeners should know about. And so we're super excited to have you on here to- today, Kevin. Happy to be here. Great. And I-, I think it would help if you could tell us a little bit about just sort of the state of play for office. Like what has been going on since the pandemic? Um, you know, everyone knows that work from home sort of shook up the, the corporate world a little bit. So can you just give us some background on what's happened over the last few years? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think the office market is is really where most of the attention has been, you know, out of all the different property types. I mean, uh, through the pandemic, the ones that got hit the hardest were office, I mean, excuse me, retail and hotel. And, you know, that story kind of got played out pretty quickly because you just knew that retail was going to come back and it did actually it came back very nicely outside of malls anyway it came out very nice it came back very nicely with retail sales rebounding hotel is now the highest adrs uh, average daily rates we've seen historically ever right now on on average nationally for hotels and so that's more of like a kind of typical situation going on there you know the mall conversation is a secular change but generally that's just typical you know real estate but for office now, we have this uh, either assumed or uh, big concern about a secular change. Like, how do we analyze this asset class might actually be completely different going forward than it was, you know, you get real estate is always a story kind of asset class. So you get guys that have been in the industry for 40, 50 years, and this is how I've always done it. Now, this is a real change where you might have to think about it differently. Um, so I sat most of the pandemic on the rating agency side of Moody's and, um, my role there was a, you know, a kind of head of CRE research. So everything that we rate that touches real estate banks and REITs and CMBS, you know, what do we do for things where office is backing that, you know, because like we're, all you're really worried about on the credit side is what's the worst case scenario. Uh, and so really dug, I mean, we rolled up our sleeves and did hundreds and hundreds of, uh, different articles, studies, uh, discussions with different, uh, players in the space, like, you know, real, uh, corporate tenant consultants and really found that 
the story is way more nuanced than Office is dead. I mean, that those headlines you kept seeing uh, is like, will people want to go back to the office? Yeah, blah, blah, blah. It, it, it's a very complicated story. And remote working is 40 years old, back with IBM in 1983. Uh, and, you know, the government actually doing a lot of telework plans over the last few decades. It's, a, it's not a new story. And we really found that it's, it's a very nuanced how remote working actually translates into more or less office demand. Um, and the ideal state of things is not full remote working um, for all kinds of very obvious reasons and some less obvious. But bottom line is, is that um, we did not see a max ex mass exodus of all corporate office tenants out of office uh, in during the pandemic. And we don't expect that to happen going forward either. The data has really not continued to show that that's not the case. If you look at the last three or four cycles, this has actually been one of the most benign cycles for the office sector, um, despite all of this worry right now. So we're watching it in a bunch of different ways, but bottom line is, is that the apocalypse has not arrived yet, uh, but we have a ton of ways to, to, to watch and, and see if it's on its way. You said this is one of the most benign times in in uh, real estate uh, in in office space. Is that compared to two thousand eight? One of my my first jobs in real estate was cold calling office uh, offices and trying to get them to uh, sign new new leases with a. I worked for a tenant rep agency, um, and vacancy rates back in this was back in two thousand nine were insane back then. It was like thirty percent in downtown Denver higher in some places in Denver. Um, are, are vacancy rates that high now or how do they compare to the last downturn? Yeah, so um, so sticking to occupancies, vacancy rates, uh, right now uh, office vacancy rates average nationally, um, the occupancy rate is about 82%-ish. Uh, so vacancy rate, we just hit 18.5 uh, this last quarter. Um, but and, and and you know it's been that low before. It was it was you know occupancy rate was 82 uh, in the worst of the financial crisis. It was 83 in the worst of the tech boom bust. Uh, and then in the early 90s, it was it was uh, a, about 81 percent. Um, but kind of peaked the trough. You know we only saw about a two percent decline in occupancy rates this time. The last time it was a five percent decline. The time before that was nine. The time before that it was twelve. So we saw these big kind of busts before. We didn't really see it this time. It was already relatively low coming off the financial crisis, and it didn't drop dramatically. A lot of subleasing going on, which which was somewhat new, but. Subleasing means that somebody is actually taking the sublease. So, and there is a physical, or, or, excuse me, there is actually a lease on the property. My point, my point is, is that we we just really didn't see that dramatic kind of very pro cyclical behavior of the office uh, market that we do in other, because basically, you know. Uh, because of remote working, comp companies were able to stay going. They didn't have to do the same kind of layoffs that they did in prior crises. And so they kept the lease. Maybe they did a sublease, but they still kept the lease. So just in, in general, this that, that bust that happened over the last couple of years did not cause a bust in the office market like it typically does. And is the same thing true with, with pricing um, generally in terms of leases? Are they still pretty stable from where they were prior to the pandemic? Yeah. So effective rents, effective means basically just taking into account concessions and uh, tenant improvement packages that tenants will typically get to move into a, uh, a space. You know, So effective rents declined just shy of 2%. This time, 12% uh, in the GFC, the Great Financial Crisis, Global Financial Crisis, and then 27% uh, in the in the in the tech bust. So you know, again, just a relatively minor uh, adjustment in rent. And we've seen in many markets now, uh, particularly the Sun Belt, uh, where we've seen office rents have been. Right now, there's this big dispersion of office rents going on where definitely laggard markets like New York and San Francisco, but then a lot of markets like, you know, uh, in Florida and, and, and again, the Sun Belt, the Southeast, we're seeing in Phoenix, we've seen rents actually do quite well, uh, really nice rent growth for office in those markets. So that doesn't tend to pretend an apocalypse. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. So I, I mean, I do see a lot of uh, headlines that sort of look apocalyptic. You know, obviously, you've mentioned a few things that have kept office in a pretty solid state over the last couple of years. 
What is your, you know, generally speaking, outlook for Office over the next few years? Because we're, we're facing a, you know, we're either in a recession or close to one or potentially facing one. And do you think that's going to change the dynamics of Office going forward? Yeah, our baseline scenario on all our forecasts right now, don't assume a recession right now. There is, we're getting close to that. I think our, our, our recession likelihood, our Moody's house view is about 65% right now. I think when it hits 66 or 67 percent is when we're officially like baking in a recession in the baseline scenario. Uh, but at any rate, on our on our baseline, we we just have a very slow recovery for Office to kind of come back to where it was pre-pandemic around 20, 2024, 2025, and that's based on a, a a lot of different assumptions about Office that I'll, I'll mention in a second here. But in the downside, we're we're now taking a different approach where we say, okay, in a downside scenario where you do hit a recession, companies go into cost-cutting mode. They need to figure out a way to make some savings. And one important point I'll bring up right now is that um, office costs, your cost of your real estate as a corporate tenant, on average, it's somewhere around 4% of your gross revenue of your of your company. Uh, so compared to other expenses like your human capital, are four, five, six, seven times of that. Uh, you know, that's where all your expenses are, and you have to make sure you manage that uh, first. And all of your thoughts about expenses really need to be focused on that. So you hear a lot of C, it's a lot of CEOs and some CFOs have famously come out and said, "We're going to slash our office space," but then had to retract that later when they realize they're getting basis points of savings. Uh, and but don't really know necessarily how they're going to implement that, and it might come at the cost of their human capital and their ability to retain people. And interestingly, for tech companies, it's even smaller of a percentage of their revenue, their real estate. So you see Google and Facebook and companies like that opening up new offices in, in New York, despite all of this talk about office not being necessary, because they know their people want to be in those high amenity, cool markets. You know, uh, again, New York is still one of those. Uh, maybe New San Francisco is a different story these days. But uh, the point is, is that, you know, real estate is is expensive but it's not your biggest expense so your savings might come at the cost of other things that are a big deal to you and that's one of the reasons why uh you know we don't port, we don't foresee a, an, an immediate exodus out of the office um so anyway in our downside scenario we assume when you go into those cost cutting mode where you have to get you have to get some savings somewhere you now have precedent in a triage situation where you just you you, you got to cut costs to survive. Uh, you could just have everybody work from home for a little while while you ride out a downturn. So if you got a lease expiring, only about 10% of leases expire every year overall. Well, that roll is actually pretty slow. The average lease terms nine ten years for office. So uh, you know as that churn comes through through a downturn, we expect that churn to be higher in a downturn going forward. So in future down uh, in future down cycles, we expect more downside do volatility for office. Uh, so you can get dips that are much bigger than what we just saw now. Um, so yeah, basically we have a slow recovery with a more intense downside scenario. To answer your question shortly, it's interesting because I was you had, you cited some other data about other downturns, and it seems like this eighty to eighty two percent occupancy was. The largest, you know, sort of like a a, sea, a basement, you could say, for how how low occupancy is going. How how low do you think the further downside risk could be? Uh, we right now we're it's it, it seems like it might be nominal, but at least another a p full point of vacancy rate. Um, you know, which sounds nominal, but it's actually not. It's actually quite a bit. Um, and then you know, there's a big variance there too. Your uh, the the quality of your office can matter quite a bit. So if if you're if you have a you know high amenity building with good access to transportation, uh, you know it's a mission critical headquarters for a company. Uh, you're just in a better position uh, than other you know offices that just don't have any of what I just described. Um, so we're starting to see what's a lot of people in the market. Conventional wisdom is that there's going to be this separation of the curds from the way you know there's going to be a, a a barbelling going on we're just starting to see a little bit of that when we just objectively look at the data um and it makes sense that that would be happening where you're, some of these mar some of these offices might see some pretty big value decline where others basically are, are fine yeah it's it's i i 
totally resonate with what you're saying about the office and being sort of important to almost the identity of a lot of these companies, right? Like Google has formed their identity there. You know, a lot of people talk about like your, um, like your hiring brand, like about having cool offices and like, you know, Google's an enormous company and they're probably looking past a short term recession and want to maintain that brand and be able to retract really attract really good talent. Um, there are probably to your point, some other companies where that's not as important working remote is, uh, is more accepted or not as important to their, to their hiring practices. Um, so it'll be, uh, it'll be super interesting to see what happens. What, one of the, I asked you this before we jumped on, but one of the narratives I've heard a lot about, about a potential increase in the unemployment rate, because right now we're seeing a lot of the standard markings of a recession. But the one thing we haven't seen is an increase in the unemployment rate. Um, and a lot of people think that will happen. And if that does happen, do you think that change in the dyna- power dynamics of the labor market, where employers now have more power um, over the workers, they'll start calling more people back to the office and sort of lay down the law? Or do you think we're sort of entrenched in the amount of work from home that is, uh, you know, the amount of days work from home um, in the economy for now? For sure, some some companies are already laying down the law, as you say. I mean, Citibank and Goldman had people back in the office frequently last year. Um, And that's this fall is very interesting because this is really the first official time that there's no excuses. Uh, You know, we had Omicron and then we had the summer. And nobody wants to work in the summer, so you kind of let your your uh, you know you just let you let that policy of being able to work from anywhere kind of keep going through the summer. And now in the fall, we're seeing a lot of you know uh, people calling or uh, uh, the C suites are calling the people back, and you know we're seeing a lot of anchor day strategies where you know you you have to be there on Tuesday, but then you get to pick one other day. And then, you know, and some people are picking to be in the office more. That's the other thing. Like not everybody wants to be at home uh with their family or their kids or their maybe they have a small apartment. Um but there, there's a lot of motivation motivated factors for either being in the office or being at home. You know, we're starting to see that change this fall. So I'm very I, I'm very excited to see, you know, how this starts to play out and new leases that get signed, what new floor plates look like. Um, yeah. And so the power dynamic is def- definitely already shifting. And you're right, you know, as as layoffs start happening, which, you know, look, uh, per crunch base, we had 42,000 tech workers um, uh, already being, getting laid off in this last quarter. Um, and, you know, some of the other announcements in New York are actually Meta, Facebook, um, they started taking down a lot more space in New York, but now they're planning to close one of their offices, expecting more layoffs coming. Uh, same thing with Goldman and some other companies announcing some layoffs. So, so yeah, I think there's some bargaining power <laughs> on behalf of the, uh, the, 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 the tenants or the corporate tenants and their ability to get people back in the office. But one important part about this is, you know, you see the castle data cited all the time, uh, the security card swipe company that's been posting the work u- utilization rates where Texas is in the 60% utilization rate now. And New York has been climbing its way up from like the 20% finally up into like 45, 50% now. Um, and I, people want to kind of correlate that utilization rate to vacancy rate. That I've seen that happen in many, many studies now. And there's just no indication that that's really going to be the case. So if everybody's coming in on a Tuesday anchor day and that's your strategy, where, how are you going to cut space? You know, you really have to have a dynamic hoteling desk kind of situation and then add no new collaborative space in order to actually make that vacancy rate match that u- utilization rate. Just to be clear. So what you're saying is like, People are looking at data that shows how frequently someone goes into the office and how 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 used, like you said, utilization rate, how used an office is, and trying to say like, oh, people are going to the office less, so that must mean that office space is going to see an uptick in in vacancy. But you're saying those two things are not actually correlated. It could be, or it couldn't be, or you don't. We don't even really know that. It- the degree to which it will happen yet. So let's just say that you have a 50% utilization rate. What's your, what's your actually, are you going to sign fit for 50% less space? I mean, the answer is probably no. Um, We've been 
talking to uh, consultancy companies that advise corporate tenants on how much space they should take down per employee, what their floor plates should look like. And they're definitely evolving right now. And there are studies about how important collisions among your people are uh, so that you get a, an you know, some people say, hey, I'm more productive at home. Why don't we just all work from home? The reality is the aggregate productivity of your workforce is what you really care about. And you need your people running into each other to network. You know, you, I mean, you know, if you're just starting an industry and you have no network and you have no mentorship, it's not super easy to do that over Zoom, if not impossible. And so, and that's important for companies, you know, collaboration really is way more important. I think people kind of want to write it off sometimes, but it's very important. Every day people aren't in the office, they, they run into other people dramatically less. So the advice now is to have more spaces like libraries or bigger kitchens, um, you know, uh, just more conference space, basically anywhere you can, any way you can get your people to run into each other more, you need to have that more space. So maybe you have less private offices, but you have to take down more space on that side. So how this utilization rate actually translates into how much space you lease as a tenant is not clear yet at all. And it's not clear that it's going to be dramatically less. All right. Well, thank you. So it sounds like, I, you know, this has been really helpful because I want for our audience to understand sort of the state of play for office because not as not everyone is as familiar with office as they are with residential real estate. And it sounds like things didn't go as badly during the pandemic as the media has portrayed. It did go down, but not super dramatically. You do see additional downside risk, but you don't see the bottom really falling out. So I'd love to turn the conversation. And I know most of your clients at Moody's are institutional investors, but I'd love for you to just tell us a little bit about like, what are the opportunities that you see for investors in the office space going forward? Yeah, well, I mean, the most obvious one is is um, is the topic that we've written about, and you know, the Fed has written about recently as well, is the conversion of office space into housing. Um, you know, that uh, that's certainly a viable um, way to get more housing. You know, we're in areas that need more housing, um, but. We, it's not yet, there hasn't been enough decline in value of offices. Actually, the decline has been negligible almost. Um, the capital markets can, even though the volume is down on purchasing offices, the, there hasn't been a lot that have been sold at big discounts yet. Um, but at any rate, if they do start, if on the edges, on the fringes, if you start to see some of these offices that might be in obsolete from an amenity standpoint, they're just not the right floor plate size, but they happen to be the right floor plate size for apartments. You know, you got that kind of 26 to 28 foot floor depth or whatever um, on either side of a mechanical well then you know you might actually be able to profitably convert that into office or excuse me into multifamily those are probably opportunities out there for scrappy investors i don't see it being widespread the numbers just don't work out um, we track about a, like for example we track about 1100 properties in new york uh, office properties in new york of those we you know did a rough justice analysis all this real estate analysis is very uh, idiosyncratic to the asset itself uh, and I'll get into that in a second, but just doing rough justice, we only found about 35 of those 1,100 that were 35? suitable for conversion into what? multifamily at a profitable. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, they had to. They have to have um, the value of those offices be low enough. Uh, the rent has to be low enough. The vacancy hit needs to be pretty high because you got to got to kick out a lot of tenants or pay them out. Um, and then the floor plate has to be the right size. You know. And that's not that's not typical. Uh, you, you know, you have some you have much deeper floor plates in office than you do in multifamily. So um, you know there, but look, that's just the ones that we track, and we made some rough justice assumptions now. But let's say that you find yourself an office building that doesn't have great amenities. Its floor plates are a little too small, um, and you're in an area that is a high rent multifamily kind of area. A kind of a dumb example that just came to me right now is not too far away from me right here is the Woolworth building. 
Uh, the Woolworth Building was the tallest building in the world in 1913. It's 12 stories. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's about 30 something stories, but it's <laughs> it's got a, a very narrow tower. Um, and so a, a developer came in, and I think in 2014 ish, and and bought that tower for something like 100 million dollars. And now the penthouse is for sale for 100 million dollars. So not forget about all the other apartments they were able to convert. But the point is, is that you had an obsolete floor plate. Uh, and a high rent, high, val- high value as multifamily or uh, condo kind of area, you probably will be able to find some opportunities like that uh, for these kind of smaller office buildings, of which there's a good number of. Um, so I don't see it being a big wave of conversions from like a lot of people have described this sort of dystopia where there's no offices anymore. And it's very like kind of you know, uh, 50 years down the line kind of thinking about the change of the urban fabric. But, uh, you know, office, there's a, there's a still all kinds of what we call agglomeration benefits for offices to be in dense areas. So I don't see it being a wave of conversions, but definitely on the fringes, uh, there's going to be some good opportunities for obsolete offices as uh, a new use, probably multifamily. Well, if I'm hearing you right, part of your analysis in which of these which of these properties would be best to convert was, are they not being used correctly now when you were going over vacancy? And was that my understanding? Yeah, what we call the highest and best use in the real estate world. They're not the highest and best use anymore. Yep. So it almost has to sink to a certain level before the conversion makes financial sense. This is more of like a backup plan. Like, okay, we can't make it work as commercial office space. People are moving to different areas. They're working from home. Something has affected this industry so much, we're going to convert to residential. So even though only 35 of them qualify now, in this hypothetical worst case scenario, if the market continues to trend downward, more than 35 would have been eligible, right? Yeah. And there's there's so many, there's such a confluence of factors here because uh, you know we were making assumptions around conversion costs. Uh, and when we were making those assumptions, we were still in a pretty high inflationary environment. Uh, a lot of construction had to slow down. Some projects got put on hold because raw materials were either inaccessible because of supply chain issues, or if they were accessible, they were much more expensive than planned, right? Um, lend, like commercial uh, uh, real estate lenders are pretty much putting the brakes on construction lending right now because there's a lot of Fed CCAR scenario re- stress requirements where they have to ha- hold too much capital to be able to do that kind of lending. Bottom line is is there's not a lot of construction going on right now because it's expensive. And also the lending is harder to get there right now. So there's other factors, David, is what I guess I'm trying to say. Which is important to note because we would never just walk in right now and say, oh, it makes more sense to go residential than commercial. Very few of them financially make sense. But this is more of a discussion from... Let's say everybody just wants to start working from home and Simon Sinek becomes president and he starts telling every millennial, like, you should never work at a job unless it aligns with your core values and everybody quits and we have this doomsday scenario. In that case, a lot of these factors would have changed, which would make more sense. It sounds like you're also describing from a purely... Adam Smith, the invisible hand, capitalistic type approach where we know that the government doesn't always work that way. They may come in and give grants to certain companies. They may give credits to them if they convert it to residential and make it low income housing. So my question would be, because I think a lot of the the fear here is if I'm a commercial investor, this what if is hanging over people's heads. When and then the minute things start to trend downward, everybody skips 20 years into the worst case scenario and they says, but what if we get to this point? I think converting these into residential units is a very solid what if backup plan. Like that's what we would do. We in many cities we don't have enough residential real estate. So if you're a commercial real estate investor or you're considering jumping in throwing your money into a project with that someone else is running, are there certain cities that you think people should be avoiding cuz the population is declining so there's not as much need for residential real estate? Real estate's obviously local. What areas would you caution people to be to be looking towards, and which areas would you say, "Hey, I'm I'm much more bearish on this this location." Well, I mean, the the migrations, the migration in the country is pretty evident at this point. Although there seems to be some counter migration happening um, into like the Wisconsin's of the world, where you know climate change is making it more uh, amenable to live in those kinds of uh, areas, you know, but obviously everything's going towards the Sun Belt still. That, that's the that's the momentum. Um, and so, you know, some of those markets might not 
have enough office space actually. So they might not really be the best examples of potential office to apartment, you know, to deal with migration issues. I think, you know, land potential landmines out there and I I, I don't want to pick on San Francisco too much because there's some countervailing forces that could uh, cause it to have a nice comeback. Um, but, you know, when crime starts to become such an issue that you start to get the 1970s and 1980s uh, impression of urban areas uh, versus today, I mean, they're just high amenity, they're safe, uh, it's easy to get around, it's very convenient, um, you know, lots of jobs available. You know, there's a lot of reasons why people live in dense areas that are positive, but whenever you start to get to the level of, um, actually, I can't remember who just moved out, a big sporting goods store just moved out of, uh, there was a, a headline about it a day or two ago about, uh, they said that essentially San Francisco has devolved into chaos. Um, and, you know, that's a pretty striking thing for a, a large business to say, and then you actually pull all operations out of a city. Uh, and anecdotally, I think we all know somebody that lives in San Francisco or we went to San Francisco and got our car broken into. David yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah, I'm uh, very, very close to yeah. that area. Yeah. So, you know, I think when you start to have the breakdown of the benefits of living in urban areas, um, that's not good for office or multifamily, you know, so that's a that that's and and you know look uh, my my uh, my thesis advisor from grad school is uh, is one of the kind of OGs of urban economics. His name's Bill Wheaton, um, and he he's he's revising his urban economic models for there to be less of a kind of demand to be in those areas and more of a demand to be in the little sister cities or pocket cities around there or, or what we call exurbs. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate on whether or not that's going to happen. There's some examples of it, uh, like Hoboken is a good example around New York is starting to be an up and coming, uh, desirable place for people, good household formation there. Um, you know, so I think maybe that's a good maybe point is to say if you, for on the opportunity side, those exurbs around, you know, really in demand MSAs. Uh, that have good household formation. That's probably where you see your opportunities. And by the way, like Hoboken will have old office buildings. Um, you know, so it has it has the anchor of New York. It has good household formation. It's probably got some obsolete offices that can be converted into multifamily physically, uh, and maybe profitably too, because you know because of that household formation, you got a uh, higher demand for housing. I think it would be irresponsible not to mention that. So I live very close to San Francisco. We sell real estate in San Francisco and around it. And it's it's fascinating that as little as four or five years ago, I believe San Francisco had the cumulative most expensive residential real estate in the country. Like it had passed up um, Honolulu. It was, it, was, it was almost impossible to get our clients anything in San Francisco. It just didn't matter what they're willing to pay. Someone would pay more. And in as, and and basically the... COVID shutdowns alone stopped that. And then, like you mentioned, the chaos that the city has devolved into, it went from being the top to one of the only cities that was losing value when everything around it was going up. And it hit across the board. It was residential. It was commercial. It was multifamily. Then the city started making more restrictions on what people could and couldn't do with their properties. Uh, rent control became like insane. Like I don't know if anyone who doesn't live there can understand how draconian some of those measures were that you could get a person in a house that would rent for $4,500 a month that would be paying $1,100 a month and was never going to leave. That just drove business away from that area. And it went from what was at one point the pinnacle creme de la creme of real estate into no one wants to touch it at this point. And I don't want to, I don't want to just say it's scary, but there are things that you could have noticed when the market was going up that would have been an indicator that this is shaky, this is volatile, this is not a solid foundation to build uh, your house on, pardon the pun. So I appreciate you bringing that up as, as an example because it's not as simple as looking backwards at data and saying, well, what happened? I'm going to just do that. 
because things, when they shift in the, especially in the real estate space, they shift incredibly quickly. So that's why I'm asking questions about, well, like what, what could we expect in the future? One of the areas that I feel real estate has evolved, because even though real estate sounds just boring and dull and just, it's been the same as it always has been for 5,000 years, it actually evolves very significantly with architectural improvements and even technological improvements. I don't think 10, 15, 20 years ago, any of us were considering renting out a part of our home to a stranger. <laughs> just just like with Uber, right. like I was told as a kid, don't get in cars with strangers. It's now people only get in cars with strangers, <laughs> right? Like things change pretty significantly. <laughs> I don't think the commercial space is immune from that same thing. It has worked a very specific way for a long time. But like you mentioned, Kevin, we're seeing differences. When I see new buildings built, there's much less cubicleness, uh, individual office space. It's much more a very large common area with a kitchen, with seating. I mean, a lot of the new buildings that I see almost look like a like a diner in a sense. They've got these like little booths where people can sit with their laptop and eat and work and everyone kind of mingles. And then you've got a handful of very like small offices that people go into and then big meeting rooms. They're almost built like like a movie theater style with like seats that start low and they go up and a speaker can come in and talk to the big group. Like that's a, that's a very significant evolution in just the architectural structure of how we're making buildings that reflects the difference in how business is being run. So if, if you're a person who's listening to this and you're nervous about investing in commercial real estate because you're just hearing the doomsday, oh, everybody's going to work from home. Uh, there's the, the tech industry is completely changing. We don't need commercial space anymore. Uh, is there hope? Are there ways that you see that that industry is going to continue to evolve to, to stay relevant in uh, the modern day workforce uh, demands? I think that uh, I'm glad you you brought up your your last series of points there because it, it reminds me of something I, I believe is going to be uh, a bit of a sea change in office and maybe a good place to invest is co-working. Uh, so there's this co-work and, and, and the world more calls it flex office. And I think that's more the appropriate term because when you hear co-working, you think uh, more of like the hot desk version of WeWork. Um, but, but flex office is actually a subtype of office that's tracked as a subtype of office in places like the UK for a long time. For the last 20 years now, actually, since started in 2003, I think Cushman and Wakefield started tracking flex office as a as a as an actually property type because um, a lot of buildings there have flex office in it uh, in the building because it's seen as an amenity for a bunch of reasons. One, it's just it's just common area space that that tenants can use like they can have guests come work out of there or maybe they have a one of their people in from another city they can work there you know um, as they expand and contract themselves they can grow into that space if they need to until they decide they want to take down more space permanently somewhere else you know and so it's it's just generally seen as additive to a building to have a curated flex office space in it in the U.S., uh, it has not at all only been WeWork that's been growing, although <laughs> you might have noticed WeWork had a bit of a hiccup there. But uh, it hasn't been we, it hasn't been WeWork only. There's been there's over 300 other uh, co-working companies uh, in the U.S., and a lot of them are more these sort of curated enterprise approach to it. Where they'll work with the landlord, um, you know, and they'll they'll make a space that's appropriate for the building, and maybe there's even um, you know uh, there's a, a relationship with the tenants in the building. So like Apple actually, I, I was talking to uh, some some brokers, and Apple actually demands that there be some co-working space in an office now, like at least a hundred desks for for flexibility for them, uh, and so. I think that co-working space is 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 good because it's doing what you just said. It's it's showing you what the it's a, it's very curated where uh, you know they can change the space so that it's suitable uh, for whatever the use is that it is. So they, it's very flexible, uh, and it has just the amenities that you expect now. You know, and so I think that that space is just going to continue to be a bigger and bigger part of offices as we go around, and that's going to be that's going to help hybrid as well. By the way, you know, so if you pop into an office and you need a place to be, maybe there's a bunch of private offices upstairs, but hey, in the first five floors, you can just reserve a desk. I mean, these companies are some of them are very small, by the way. Like I so I do think there's some investment opportunities there in that space. There's franchises and stuff. I, I've personally worked in a lot of those spaces over the course of the last ten or fifteen years, and and like them, um, I think they actually they work quite well for smaller companies and 
uh, teams that need to get together less frequently. Uh, this has been super helpful background, Kevin. For our audience, why you know why should they consider office investing over residential or storage? Like, what are the benefits to investing in office space that perhaps average retail investors like most of our audience might not be aware of? Well, the, just you know, kind of stripping away all the discussion around you know the potential apo- office apocalypse because of the uh, uh, hybrid working. The, one of the main reasons that office is attractive is because they're they're long leases, um, and you can underwrite the tenant, and you can you can you can get a tenant in there that's there for ten. I mean, for larger, I mean, the average the average lease term at uh, thirty Hudson Yards is seventeen years. Wow. I mean, that you're talking about some serious stability there. You know, so larger tenants tend to come in, and they they want to have their costs be set. They don't want to have to worry about that cost. They got too many other variable costs. And so that's the benefit of office fundamentally is that you have a long-term lease, uh, you know, it's professionally managed, uh, you know, there's, you get, you get a notification from the tenant 12 to 18 months ahead of time before their lease expires, whether or not they're going to continue, they're going to do an extension or whatever. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of stability in it traditionally, <laughs> you know, obviously now that might be shifting a little bit. We haven't seen, by the way, we haven't seen lease terms start to get shorter. There's been a lot of speculation around that. We haven't really seen that happen yet. Um, lease terms are staying roughly as they are, but that's the benefit of office. Um, you know, you 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 can. It's a it's a pretty well established asset class that you can have a, a pretty consistent. Um, you know, expense controls, you know, having a lot of churn like you do in, in multifamily. Anybody that owns a multifamily property knows that the churn is your biggest problem. I mean, it's just, a, it's very expensive and it's a pain. Uh, and there's not really anything to do with it. You can't get many people to sign five-year leases um, or 10-year leases versus, you know, the typical one-year lease. So, um yeah, that's the that's the fundamental reason. And what about price point? You know, we've talked a lot about San Francisco and New York, which obviously have extremely expensive office space that's probably prohibitive to anyone except institutional investors. Like, it, are the same opportunities available in small office spaces in smaller cities that could be more affordable and more feasible for people who are typically buying smaller residential real estate properties? Yeah. Um, I'll share, I'm trying to find that one paper that we just, that we, that we did about the uh, opportunities for conversions, but typically the office market is more expensive per square foot, uh, pretty to a pretty substantial degree. Um, I think um, the median in New York, even, even investing in like small office space. Like if you live in a smaller city where it is feasible to buy, like, you know, a, I don't know what what the right size is, but let's say ten thousand square feet of office space or twenty thousand square feet of office space. Do you think those smaller buildings still have the same prospects, or is it really these like big cities that have these really stable tenants that you're talking about that will sign a seventeen year lease? Like that, you know, you're talking about huge market cap companies here. Um, is that more of the benefit? Because I'm I'm curious, like. Do you see some of the same benefits if you're if you're leasing to a local doctor or lawyer or you know um, something like that? Is is it the same kind of thinking? Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, it, so um, if you're going to buy an office building, I mean, the first thing you'll do is look at the rent roll uh, and you'll see who's in there and what's your what's your churn coming over you know the next five to ten years. Like how when your when are the lease expirations coming? That's the, probably pretty much the most fundamental analysis. So if you have somebody in there and you find out that it's a, um, you know, a, 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 maybe that there's three main tenants and it's something like you described, it's a it's a lawyer's office, an independent firm that's been in business for a couple decades and got a couple decades more in them. That's the kind of analysis you're looking for. Uh, but if it's a if it's a something that just got built and has no tenants in it, and you're now you're thinking, okay, is it is it an infill sort of location to where um, you know, it's, it's a high value from, uh, you know, uh, locationally, this is where people want to be versus where they live versus where, you know, they need services or whatever. Um, you know, otherwise that's, that's the kind of like smaller plays that you're talking about, but the bigger ones, you know, you're really looking at the benefits of agglomeration, which are, are you in a cool market? Uh, that has decent transport, is it not cost that too much to get to your office relative to where people live? Um, and is it kind of like, a, 
like an Austin where all these companies are starting to influx in there and then that's the new hot tech market. So that's the macro analysis if you're going to more of the big play um, and you're trying to pull down the large corporate tenants uh, or tech tenants. But in general, I think I was going to tell you the median, median apartment building in New York traded at $434 per square foot in 2021 in New York uh, versus 542 for offices. So not that far off. Uh, but you do need a pretty big discount for those offices to come down, you know, to be convertible. Um, but anyway, it just offices are generally substantially more expensive per square foot. All right, great. Well, thank you. Uh, we appreciate you coming on here, Kevin. Is there anything else you think our audience should know about the office or commercial space going into 2023? Uh this is, I'm, well, you know, as I guess a real estate research nerd at this point, I'm very excited for the next year because we just have so many ways to see now what's really going on with office versus the mm -hmm. speculation, you know, is New York dead, is office dead, and the kind of back and forth articles that we've been seeing for the last couple of years. Now we can actually start seeing some real data as people come back into the offices and new floor plates get built. And we see, like, we're kind of right on the cusp of the real evolution of office right now. So I think Keep your eyes open over the next year and let's see how things play out. It's fascinating. Office space is about to get exciting for the first time in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yep. Well, thank you, Kevin. We appreciate you being here and for sharing your wealth of information. Um, uh, what I love about somebody in your position is you've experienced real estate from several different perspectives. You were involved in the construction of it. You have college degrees in the background of it. You're working in a position that I often refer to as the crow's nest. You're sort of up there at the top and you're the first person to see changes happening in the market. So you can yell down to everyone else, the whole land ho uh, <laughs> metaphor there. So thanks for sharing your information with us. Dave, I know you were saying something before I jumped in and cut you off if you finish that. No, I like your land ho metaphor. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Kevin. We appreciate your time. All right. It was a pleasure, guys. I appreciate it. We'll stay in touch. All right. So that was our interview with Kevin Fagan, who is, again, the Senior Director and Head of Commercial Real Estate Economic Analysis at Moody Analytics. Boy, that is a that is a mouthful and an impressive title. But man, guy really knows what he's talking about. It was just dropping knowledge about uh, office space, bringing up stuff I didn't even know to think about. What did you What did you learn or take away from that? conversation well first off that guy speaks your love language his title <laughs> his background everything he said your eyes were like wide open the yeah whole time. you could see me dripping with jealousy at his title it's got so many words in it it just sounds fancy <laughs> and a lot of so, like his syllable per word in his title like is that a, that would be a metric that dave would start tracking like that's amazing this guy's yeah, like yeah. win above <laughs> replacement is more than I've ever seen. Uh, I think my favorite part of our conversation was with Kevin was that he's not just looking backwards at data that has already been there and saying, well, here's what's happened. Everyone can do that. Okay. That there's art and a science to every vocation. And, and my personal opinion, when it comes to data, the science approach is looking at what's already happened and analyzing it. The art approach is in how you apply that information to what's going to happen moving forward. And I thought we got into some really good conversation about, like, for instance, San Francisco real estate. It was at one point the the creme de la creme, the king of real estate in the United States, and it fell very quickly. Uh, if you did it, if you just looked at the data looking backwards, you'd be like, San Francisco is the safest place to put your money at all. But if you had uh, the understanding of why it was so great and what was happening in that city politically, looking forward, you would have said, oh, no, no, that's not where I want to put my money. I'd rather do it somewhere else. Or these are the parts of San Francisco that I do want to put my money or this is the strategy that will work, but these strategies won't. So for instance, I think... Uh, Salesforce had a huge building and a huge workforce operating out of San Francisco. And I believe they broke their lease or they were planning to. I don't know if that actually happened, but it was a very significant thing happening in the commercial side of San Francisco. However, the residential side of San Francisco sort of kept moving without a huge blemish. Like the, the values are not increasing as much as they were, but commercially it's being hit much harder than it is residentially. And, and we got into a conversation with Kevin about, hey, creatively, if that were to happen, what would we do with the Salesforce building? What options do you have that are out there? Which is what the good investors, they're always thinking about what's coming. What options do I have? How could I be creative, right? It's less lazy than just saying, well, my spreadsheet said this is what I should get. So I'm just going to buy the building and trust that the spreadsheet's going to work it out for me. Totally. Yeah. I like those creative ideas. See, I, I'm going to wildly speculate here, but he was talking about office conversions in New York where, you know, 
cost of construction are super high. I asked a question sort of about small office spaces. Like, you know, when when I first started working at Bigger Pockets, we worked in probably, it was like a two-story, probably like 8,000, 10,000 square foot spot on an amazing area of Denver. And definitely not the highest and best use of that spot. And like, I wonder, you know, he's talking about these conversions of like office towers that are, you know, 100 stories in New York. I'm curious about whether it would work in some of these smaller or tertiary cities that are like booming right now. Like, could you find these like three, four, five story buildings that maybe maybe his analysis is not the same in those markets? Could you convert those? Because I don't know. Like, I get what he's saying, but like, they just look so tempting. You like drive by these places and you're like, that could be a cool house. Like that should be residential. And so I, I don't know, maybe, maybe that will be the trend. Um, I kind of hope so. Cause obviously in the U S we need more residential. Um, and I think there's just, there could be cool ways to, to convert some of this office space. You know, that's a good example of how politics and real estate uh, affect each other. It's not as simple as just pure science, pure data. What does the spreadsheet say? If the political environment is inclined to change the zoning, all of these options that you just talked about become relevant, right? So calling your city, asking those questions, getting to know the people that are making those decisions and understanding the political climate of where you are investing, right? If you understood San Francisco's political climate, you would have avoided investing in commercial real estate there as you saw the the trends of what was happening, like you mentioned, that with the city turning into chaos. We've seen a lot of people fleeing New York recently, and that's fueled the South Florida run up in prices. Those were actual political and macroeconomic factors that affected real estate. So we're never going to say, don't look at numbers. Numbers are, are what make you money or lose you money, but it's having a deeper understanding of what is affecting the numbers so that you can apply it and put the data on your side instead of working against you that matters. And that's why you got to be listening to podcasts like this, because it'll change the way you think, and it will give you the most recent uh, data that will help you to work backwards to figure out what caused it to change. Well said, man. Well, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think, uh, what your point, your point about, uh, zoning is particularly true. Like if you could find like, uh, mixed use zoning where you can, you have some flexibility around that, that's like a really interesting thing to try and acquire and to hold on to. Um, but yeah, I couldn't agree more with trying to understand, um, not just politically, but like, you know, you talk about infrastructure spending, just like trends in your local market that can tell you what's going on. Like, if there are uh, big, you know, corporations moving to your play, your area like Austin, yeah, commercial is going to be great. If those places are leaving, but there's still demand for housing, maybe it's a good play for a conversion. You know, you have to just like sort of understand those local trends. And as David said, it's a combination of like looking at numbers and just staying informed, going to meetups, going to city council meetings and seeing what people are talking about. You know, that's like the unsexy but really beneficial thing that like literally anyone can do to gain an advantage. And it's part of being a real estate investor, right? Like this, it doesn't get talked about when people are thinking about getting into real estate investing. They watch a 30 second ad on Instagram that someone tells them, hey, buy some cash flowing real estate. You never have to work again. And no one ever explains it's constantly evolving. It's a, this is a entire industry that you are getting familiar with, with a lot of nuance in it. Totally. How many real estate investors do you know that don't work? That's a great point. <laughs> yeah. And how many do I know that have lost all of their money that were working? It's very few. Almost all the people that lost money in real estate didn't work. And the people that are doing well do work. It's just a different kind of work, right? So I'd much rather be doing this kind of work and having these conversations than sitting in line at an auto plant, stamping metal and pretending like I'm Eminem, hoping for my next big break in a rap battle. I think this is a better overall model. Totally. Yeah. I mean, you're working for yourself. You have some control and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, personally, I love the the option to work, you know, but people still do it. But yeah, it's like that sort of and the type of work you do. Exactly. Yeah. But it's fun. Like once you get into real estate, you get started and you get to like look for these things. You look forward to those kinds of meetings, trying to find an advantage, learning everything you can about a market. It sounds daunting, but it's actually, I think, one of the fun or more fun parts of uh, being an investor. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining me here, Dave. And if you were listening, thank you for that as well. Dave, where can people find out more about you? Uh, on Instagram or on Bigger Pockets. On Instagram, I am at the Data Deli or on Bigger Pockets. Just look for me. I write a lot of blog posts. You can find me there. You can find me on Bigger Pockets as well. You can also check out my new website, davidgreen24.com, and check me out on all social media at 
David Green 24. Thanks a lot, Dave. Appreciate you being here. We will have to do this again soon. This is David Green for Dave Landho Meyer. Signing off. <laughs>